So welcome everyone to our last Wednesday weekly webinar. This is Julie Garden Robinson. I'm a professor and food nutrition specialist and I'm your moderator as well as one of your speakers today. <coughs> Cliff is having a little mic problem so I'm going to go ahead and get us started and as soon as he's able to come in and hear, <laughs> um, he'll take over his part. But I don't want to delay us because we're all on tight schedule. So just some logistics, I recognize a lot of your names, so I know you've been part of this before, so you fully know how to do this. But we have everyone in listening mode, so you can go ahead and type any questions you have in the chat pod, and that's to the left of your screen. And click to the next slide. At the end of the webinar, and actually any time in between, I will try to monitor the chat pod so that we can be sure that you can get your questions answered. Otherwise, we'll also have time at the end. And you can also ask either one of us questions. We're easy to find on the web. And there's a short survey. I promise this is the last one. I just um, did the first report for this grant, and it was really excellent to have some results to share with the sponsor. We had 250 people take the survey so far of the nine surveys, so that was really excellent response. So if you were one of those people, pat yourself on the back, we really appreciate it. So Cliff, can you I hear I can me? hear you. <laughs> it's okay, it's, it's all yours. <laughs> well, it's funny how one day makes a difference. Just yesterday plugging it in, we could talk with each other, no problem. So. Um, well, uh, thank you, Julie. And uh, today's topic, as you already are aware, deals with our, our food labels. Uh, we will highlight some of the key um, labeling requirements and uh, talk a little bit about ingredients and allergens. Some history before we uh, move into uh, just some requirements is that with uh, food labels, you know, they've been around for a long time, but it really wasn't until 1990 when they really started to uh, put together more stringent requirements for food labels. Uh, and and part of that that uh, a food label, a nutrition labeling and, and education act of 1990 um, really focused on nutrition labeling, so regulating the nutrition uh, part of that, that label. Uh, it also allowed the FDA to get a better uh, handle on what food companies were putting on their label. And the idea being that you're protecting the consumer is basically what you're doing. And so when they um, developed these, they had the consumer in mind. Um, but recognizing that in, in 1990, uh, it was kind of their first attempt at, at these more stringent regulations. One of the things they also did with this particular act was they uh, really included uh, regulations regarding nutrient content claims as well as health claims. So that was something new. Um, again, the idea is that you're not represent, misrepresenting your food by making some sort of claim that you're going to cure cancer or something else um, or some other disease. So again, the, the focus being on regulating these specific claims that, that individuals uh, could make. It's also important to recognize that shortly after this, in 1993, they uh, worked with the, the Food Safety Inspection Service or the FDA worked with the Food Safety Inspection Service and change some of the uh, regulations. And the idea behind this is that these um, acts allow for us to include amendments. And these amendments might be minor changes. And one of those changes um, that I'll highlight would be a trans fat um, and the addition of trans fat on labels. And so at in 1990, trans fats weren't really thought of as really that bad for you. 
but as we got into the literature, we started looking at studies, we found, well, maybe they're not so great for us. And so the idea was is that the government then had an amendment about changing that label requirement to include trans fat. And so again, by 2018, the intent is to be zero trans fat. So again, keep in mind that with these acts, you can have amendments being added, and as a result, you um, basically change a lot in, in minor, minor ways. Also, keep in mind that the Code of Federal Regulations, and David uh, mentioned the Code of Federal Re Regulations a couple of times in, in last week's seminar, um, but it's important to understand that with the Code of Federal Regulations, this is kind of the, the place that that people get information. So this Code of Federal Regulations, again, is that, that place. So if you want to go online and access that, you, you can. Uh, so it's, they're, they're laid out beautifully for you. Uh, but with regards to food labeling, uh, Title IX and then Title 21 are really two um, that deal with, with kind of the labeling. And with Title IX, it's more about the USDA in terms of animals and animal products, whereas Title 21 covers more of the jurisdiction of the FDA. And always remember that with Title 21, they also cover drugs in that, that CFR. So let's have a, a little uh, quiz for you here or a question. Um, and if you can, in the chat box, if you want to go ahead and write down the, the letter that you think best addresses this. Um, the functions of the Nutrition Label and Education Act include which of the following? And so I'll just give you about 10 seconds to, to look over those answers. Okay, good. So keep in mind then that with this Nutritional Education Act that we uh, have all of the above. So it really addresses um, the requirements um, that all foods have to bear this nutrition label. So that, that is essentially what we have with this act. Um, it assists, again, the FDA in assuring uh, really this a correctly labeled product, something that's not misbranded, but it's also ensuring some of the safety and wholesomeness of that product. And finally, um, again, when we talk about uh, regulating nutrient content and health claims, that's really probably the strongest part of that act, in my opinion, because I think it really prevents people from making claims that are really not truthful. Uh, the second part of our, our quiz, then, is uh, where can you find the latest information um, from the FDA and the USDA regulations, or about the FDA and USDA regulations? So again, I'll give you just about 10 seconds to to answer. So in this particular case, um, we're looking at the Code of Federal Regulations. And so that is where, again, if you want the regulations with regards to a label um, or any other, in, uh, any other type of federal regulation, you go to the Code of Federal Regulations because, again, uh, there's all sorts of regulations out there. With foods, we focus primarily on, on Title IX and Title 21, but there are other ones out there. Um, so again, recognizing that if you want to know about our regulations, check out the Code of Federal Regulations. It's also important to remember that food companies or people that are manufacturing food, it is their responsibility to check the, the Code of Federal Regulations. What are the current current uh, requirements. Given that the FDA, uh, given that the FDA uh, really has these requirements, the, the question becomes, does, does your business qualify for an exemption? Always remember that the federal government looks at the United States holistically, meaning that it wants to uh, protect the safety uh, of the, the most citizens in the country. 
And so a lot of their, their regulations are based on typically large corporations where there's a, 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 a mass uh, distribution of food products. So if you're a small, small local company that sells only to the specific town of interest, there's not a lot of people that can be injured with regards to that, that food item versus if you're a, a multi-million dollar company and you're distributing tens of millions of products a year. In that particular situation, there's that potential. So always remember that that with a lot of these regulations, there's kind of always these exemptions to, to some of the rules. Um, and if we look at, at nutrition labeling, um, some of these exemptions include, um, again, small, certain small businesses and businesses that meet specific criteria. And we'll cover these just in a, in a few, few slides. Um, they're basically exempt from having a nutrition label. Uh, keep in mind that a lot of small businesses do include a nutrition label, so there's nothing wrong with that, provided they're following the appropriate guidelines. Uh, but you don't necessarily have to write or have a nutrition label if you meet the exemption criteria. What's very important to remember, though, is that if you are a small business, so you're a, you're a small business, you meet the uh, number of products you sell per year, et cetera, if you make a nutrition claim, so if you decide, well, I want to I promote uh, the protein or the fiber content of my product, at that point in time, you are no longer exempt because you're making a nutrition claim. So it's important to, to recognize that, that as long as you're not making a claim, you would still probably meet these exemptions. Um, but what's also important about these exemptions uh, is that, so it's not only the information on your, your, the product's package that's important, but it's also in the advertising. So if you had put an ad in the paper trying to sell your product and you're making claims about it, having a certain amount of fiber and a certain amount of protein, then you know, are no longer exempt. So, so that's an important thing to remember is that it's not necessarily only on that package, it's also in the advertising of that, that product. So under the, the FDA regulations then, um, recognize that all domestic and imported foods sold in interstate commerce would be required to have this nutrition label. Uh, these would include eggs, okay, so sh the shell eggs, uh, but it excludes meat and poultry. And remember with meat and poultry, that's a USDA thing. So we'll come back and cover USDA shortly here, but USDA covers meat and poultry. Um, it covers bottled water, and then it also covers uh, wine beverages less than 7% alcohol. You go beyond that, then you're into the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. That's then who regulates higher amounts of alcohol content. Um, so in this particular case, keep in mind that as long as you're selling your product locally and you're not shipping it to, to Minnesota or South Dakota, you might qualify for an exemption if you're a small business. However, if you have a product then that, that you make it in, in Jamestown and you have an internet cell that's in Minnesota, then that becomes more of an interstate commerce type of of situation, and so then you do have to put that label on there. So it's important to understand that when we talk about interstate commerce, uh, the, the importance of that, because it, it is a, a criteria that defines whether or not you have to put a nutrition label on that product or not. So let's just give some examples of, of exemptions. Um, if we take a look with the, the FDA, they say if it's a small business, uh, some of the important criteria would include that your gross sales is less than 500,000. So your sales are less than 500,000. And um, 
part of your gross sales include food, and that's only uh, equals 50,000. So again, they have criteria for amount of sales, uh, gross sales that you can have based on their small business definition. And small business definitions depends on who you ask. But in this particular case, this is what the FDA defines. Another thing is, is that you have fewer than 100 employees. Um, and then you also sell less than 100 units of each product. Okay, so, so depending on what your product is, again, selling less than 100,000 units of that um, is, is considered in this exempt category. Um, uh, keep in mind there's some important definitions with regards to products. So when we talk about products, uh, a, a product here um, is, is defined as a food with the same brand name and statement of identity. Okay? So if, if you're, you're selling a bread product and you're selling a, a, a jam or a jelly, those would be different different products. Uh, so again, uh, it's that same name or same statement of identity. Uh, a unit is defined as the, the package um, essentially of that product or form in which you intend to offer that for sale. Okay, so again, there are some exemptions here, but remember the importance of the employee number, the importance of the unit and then the, the gross sales that you, you can have for that, your particular company. Some other things to, to you know, if you have a client that wants to know, am I exempt? Um, so if they, you know, answer true to any of the following statements, uh, they may be ex um, exempt from or excused from this nutrition labeling. And for example, the manufacturing of food products that contain insignificant amounts of mandatory nutrients, you know, tea, spices, uh, coffee, those types of products. Um, another area that a lot of people, when I have people that call in and I send their names off to Julie, uh, they basically, uh, want to manufacture something for, for restaurants or s food service. Um, and, and in those particular cases, again, if you're into that business, uh, you would be exempt from, from that as well, provided you're not, you don't have more than 100 employees and you don't, um, you don't make over um, that 500,000 500, uh, gross income. Um, and then also, uh, there's a number of other things. So uh, the food business produces ready to eat products uh, that are prepared on site and not sold outside the location. So that's again uh, a case where again nutrition label is not not required. And then finally, um, if this business manufactures food that will be further processed. Uh, impact or labeled at another location. So you're just a supplier of the raspberry puree that somebody's going to use to make their jam or jelly. You're just selling the puree to them and they're making a jam or jelly. So that's, that's again, um, would, would give you some exemptions from having to label your raspberry puree. Uh, along the same lines, um, again, when we talk about exemptions, uh, you know, the food is packaged in less than 12 square inch uh, labeling area. Uh, in that particular case, if it's a small label, you, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty tough to put a nutrition claim uh, on that, that particular product. Um, so what instead, um, if you have a situation where you have such a small area, keep in mind that you have to put that address and phone number there because the students, or excuse me, the, the consumer needs to reach you somehow, but it also allows them to ask you about nutrition information. So I think it's important to recognize that you're giving them an, an avenue where they can get that nutrition information, even though it's not directly on that package. Um, in this particular case, you have another situation where they have a multi-unit 
containers. So several containers that are packed into one one box or or uh, other type of system. Uh, individual units do not necessarily have to be labeled. Okay, so your main box might have a label, but individual label products may not. But keep in mind that if you do that, then you're not allowed to sell these individual units uh, at the retail level. So, so just be aware of that. Um, and then uh, the last thing here is that I sell bulk materials or, or containers. Um, Again, it's important that the containers are, are labeled with appropriate information, but maybe not necessarily that nutrition label. So again, keep in mind that, that there's a number of exemptions here that would be required uh, if, if you're, you're um, typically a, a small company. Uh, some other, other questions that arise oftentimes is, uh, how about if I have a, a single ingredient fish or game meat? Um, again, in that particular case, you don't necessarily need that that nutrition label uh, present there. Um, infant foods, uh, infant foods are kind of a touchy area in the sense that um, you know you're you're feeding it to infants that maybe haven't a fully developed immune system, so it's important to recognize that that it, you probably are likely going to be subjected to s separate regulations. So you're going to have some other requirements that you would have to meet if you want to sell an infant food. Uh, so your exemption isn't your, your main issue here. It's can you meet the other uh, specific requirements. I, I really caution small producers into getting into this, this particular area because there's a lot of, a lot of food safety issues we would have and so uh, I always ask people if they really want to get into that particular area of business. Um, but recognizing there's going to be some exemptions but there's also going to be some different regulations that are, are needed in that scenario. And then the other exemption here is that your business sells, um, you know, uh, foods that are commonly consumed raw the fruits and vegetables and fish. And so um, you would have maybe some voluntary regulations, but you're not going to have this mandated nutrition label requirement. So if you're, you're selling apples or um, uh, berries or some sort, you don't necessarily have to have that nutrition label uh, provided. If we take a look at the USDA regulations, um, keep in mind that the USDA regulations are, are very similar to the FDA's, um, however, also recognizing that they will cover domestic and imported meat and poultry products, as well as products that what they define as related. So this would be the meat or poultry containing stews, pizzas, frozen foods, etc. So if you have a, a pizza product, and it has pepperoni on there, well, you have a meat product there, or a hamburger uh, a pizza. Uh, so it's, it's important to recognize meat and, and poultry and related products are, are covered by more of the USDA regulations versus the FDA. Again, just like the FDA, you have uh, exemptions. Uh, you know, my business produces raw single ingredient meat products, ground beef, chicken breast, et cetera. Um, again, this is more of a subject to a voluntary regulation. So again, you're, you're not necessarily required to have that, that nutrition label. With the USDA, they consider 500 people uh, or 500 employees as, as that cutoff for exemption. You know, the FDA had a little bit lower number, uh, but at 500 employees. And in their particular context, they are looking at you selling 100,000 pounds or, or less annually. And that's how you can get that exemption from that nutrition labeling. And again, always remember that they are looking at a two-year average. 
So if you're producing 105,000 pounds one year and 90 the next, you still are less than that 100,000 pounds to meet that exemption requirement. And then the other thing here is that my business produces products that weigh less than a half an ounce net weight. Okay, so again, uh, that unit is very small. A half ounce is not very much. And so, again, you would, you would qualify for that exemption. Just like the U.S., or excuse me, just like the FDA, the USDA, if it, if it has this 12-inch uh, square label area, you have that no uh, nutrition claim needs to be made. So again, that package is, is important. Um, always remember, again, that you're, you're providing addresses, a, a phone number, et cetera, where they can obtain that information if they're interested in knowing. So that's kind of the caveat to, to that is that, yeah, it's a small label, but that address and telephone number needs to be there to help uh, be a point of contact for that consumer. Uh, also then, uh, my business prepares, serves, and sells food products that are, again, ready to eat and are packaged or portioned at retail. So that would be... Um, I sell a quarter of a beef to Cashwise in, in, in town here, and then Cashwise cuts it up and sells it at retail. So that, that's an example um, of, of a meat product, per se. Or if you sell apples, and you sell the apples to Walmart, and they, they chop it up and, and put uh, lemon juice on that and mix it with other fruit, and then they're selling at a retail, that's, again, another kind of example of that. Um, you have multiple ingredient products that are processed at the retail store. So, again, kind of with that apple example that I provide you. And then, again, restaurant and food service products. So, you don't need to put that label there because they will use that, that food service uh, will use that ingredient that you provide and mix it with other things. So the nutrition is going to change based on what other things are added to that. So that's why they don't really, but that's why they give you that exemption for that specific uh, type of, of food product you want to sell. Another thing is that my business uh, manufactures food products that are not for sale to consumers. So the, the intent is that you're not going to sell that product directly to consumers, but it's going to be further processed or exported is the intent. So, again, these um, meet these USDA exemptions. So, um, just, again, recognizing differences between the FDA and USDA are not really that, that different. Um, one of the very important take-home messages to get, though, is that if you voluntarily provide nutrition label and health claims on your package. So you're voluntarily doing this. You qualify for an exemption, but you're still voluntarily adding um, this information to a, a label. This exemption no longer applies. And so that's the important thing to remember here is that the, the client then would have to put that nutrition label on that package because you are, are highlighting some health claim or highlighting some nutrition claim, and so therefore you are exempt, or you're not exempt at that particular point. So let's take a little quiz here. Um, so the question here is, a business qualifies for a, a small business nutrition label exemption from the FDA when, which of these is true, A, B, C, or D? Okay, I see a couple of Ds, and that is correct. So in this particular case, remember that we said that with the FDA, you have 100 workers, or you have sales of less than 100 units of product. And we also mentioned that gross sales of 500,000 for that company, and 50,000 of which would be for food specifically. So again, it's a case where uh, B and C were the uh, 
or answer D was the correct response because both B and C are true. So let's shift gears a little bit and uh, talk about some of the types of information that's uh, required for uh, the nutrition labels. And much of my discussion will focus on the FDA and U USDA requirements. Um, at the end of this presentation, Julie will highlight some uh, requirements from the North Dakota Department of Health and specifically their division of, of food and lodging. So she will have that toward the end of the uh, presentation. But when we look at a food label, keep in mind that information on that, that product kind of fits three general categories. The first here is a mandatory and required. Uh, with mandatory and required, that information absolutely has to be on that package. So you have to, to uh, have that information listed. And I will cover that in the next few slides. The next group of information or type of information would be optional or voluntary, but it also is regulated. So it, it's, a, it's a case where you have this optional information, but you still have to follow the, the FDA or USDA regulations with regards to how you present that material. And then finally, information to assist consumers to, to better understand that product. And, and this is going to be information that would be such as a, a cooking instructions. How do I cook this product? Uh, it might be that somebody has a recipe and they, you know, uh, for example, they might uh, have a breakfast cereal like Rice Krispies and, and on that package they have the recipe to make Rice Krispie bars. So that's the type of information that's there to help the, the consumer understand that product. Um, information such as, as information regarding uh, an ancient grain or flaxseed or amaranth, etc. on that label where they can talk about what these things are, but they cannot make any association with uh, dietary fiber or other other health benefit uh, in this general information. So they can talk about what flax is, but once they make that statement that it's high in dietary fiber, then that goes back up into this optional, voluntary, but regulated type of category. So just recognizing that in this particular case, um, information that's there to help consumers can be on that package as well. So let's just highlight some of the required information, uh, product identity, uh, net weight, uh, remember nutrition facts, uh, unless you qualify for an exemption, nutrition facts should be there, uh, ingredient statements, and then place of business. So these are things that must be on that, that label somewhere. So I want to be able to read that, that label and that information. The first thing to remember is the principal display panel. That's kind of that thing that catches your eye at the grocery store. That's that kind of where you have all that information about what that product is. Um, this is regulated under 21 CFR 101.1 to 101.3. Uh, I will not cover all the details because certain size packages have certain requirements font size, et cetera, like that. So I'm not really going to cover that. But what I want you to just recognize is that on the, the principal display area, that's kind of that surface area of that package that's going to draw your attention and it's going to tell you what that product is. Uh, the principal display area uh, must include a statement of identity or the name of the food. So that has to be on that product. Is it milk? So in this particular example, it's milk, and specifically, it's two percent low-fat milk that's been pasteurized and homogenized. Uh, so again, a statement of identity uh, or the name of the food, the net quantity statement, uh, or the amount of product in that that food. Keep in mind that it's not what the package weighs; it's the the weight of the contents in that package that that you put on that label. So the statement of identity then, uh, some of the common or usual names that you might see would be a soup, a cereal, 
you might see bread. So again, these are very common food items, but you still have that that um, name of that product, that it's a soup or it's a, a cereal, etc. cetera. Um, if there is no common or usual name, then we try to use a descriptive, descriptive name uh, for that particular food. Uh, for example, vanilla wafers. Uh, it's a vanilla flavored wafer type of baked item. So, so again, in this particular case, if it, if it has a common or usual name associated with that type of product, use that. If it doesn't, try to be as descriptive as you, as you can. With regards to an example of the statement of identity, uh, in this particular case, you can see that you have a picture of the, the cereal, uh, but you're identifying it specifically as a cereal. So that's the important thing. When we talk about the statement of identity, we're defining this as a, uh, as a cereal in this particular case. And ideally, um, if you don't have uh, a, a, a clear plastic bag, um, you would then have that image of that product. The other thing here that's important is the net quantity statement. And, and that's the amount of food in that package, as I, as I indicated earlier. Um, it's typically presented as um, two measurements, a U.S. scale, an ounce, pound or fluid ounce, or it's a metric, and it's a metric scale, so grams, kilograms, milliliters, liters. So you have to include both on that, that label. Uh, so a, an example of this would be, again, a, a rice product where you have the net, net weight in, in ounces, and then you have net weight in grams. So it has both, both units. Um, and what's important also is that this net quantity statement is at the bottom 30% of that, that package. So if it's a box of, of rice or box of cereal or something, that's the expectation. If you have a different type of package, it's going to have different requirements in terms of where it would be located. So I'm not going to cover all that. I think it's important, though, if you go to the, the food and um, or the code of food, the, the regulations, the code of federal regulations, excuse me, uh, that's where you're going to find specific details about other types of packaging. So t take a look there, uh, but just recognizing that there are requirements about placement of these different statements, as well as font sizes. So the informational panel then, this is something that's going to uh, be right next to the uh, principal display area. It's typically to the right of that principal display area. Specific requirements, though, can be found on, in 21 CFR 101.4. So if you have a, something that's a circular container, there's different requirements there. Uh, so it, it's a, if it's a bottle, there's different requirements for that. If it's an ice cream container, different requirements. So just be aware of, of you know, placement of these different uh, types of information. So uh, again, with the informational panel, uh, that would include things as nutrition facts, the ingredient statement, the place of business. Uh, that's what's considered um, important information. It's also mandatory information unless you have an exemption for, uh, for the nutrition facts panel. Uh, just to give you a sense of where your informational panel would be, like on a box of cereal, again, you have your principal display area here, your nutrition facts, your in ingredient, and then manufactured by. So that's kind of where uh, you would find the, the general type of, of information. And then with that, I will end and move on uh, and let uh, Julie covered the rest. Take it away, All Julie. right. Well, thank you, Cliff. Well, as you can see, Cliff is a really good teacher, and I just wanted to congratulate him. He received a very prestigious teaching award on campus recently. So thanks a lot for sharing your teaching ability with us, Cliff. Yeah, no problem. I'd like to, <laughs> I'd like to uh, talk with you a little bit about nutrition facts. 
And this is an area of my job where I've done uh, literally hundreds, if not over a thousand labels for different companies. So if you are needing something like that, I can certainly help you out. And we have confidentiality statements. We do have to charge a fee because the software I use is quite expensive. But uh, just to give you some more information about nutrition facts labels, of course you have to list the serving size the calories, and the, nutri the nutrient information. As Cliff mentioned, there are many exemptions, but sometimes when you sell to a particular business, their policy may be that we don't sell anything in our store without a nutrition label. So even though you might be exempt in a small business, if the grocery store that you're working with says, we want a nutrition label, then you do it. And so I, I get a lot of small businesses that I work with not only on the nutrition facts, which I run based on the formula, but also on how to list ingredients and how to list allergens. So I will be talking about those areas as we proceed. Well, some nutrients are mandatory and some are voluntary. The information that's on a nutrition facts label, if you have a, something next to you that's, that is labeled with the nutrition facts, you might even want to pick it up and take a look. Um, sometimes if nutrients are present in a very small amount, they don't even have to be on the label. Um, so there are many, many different formats for labels, but depending on the level of nutrients, you might see some and you might not see some. So these are typically the mandatory nutrients and the order in which they must appear. So if you decide to create your own nutrition label, you do have to follow this order and specific font size and you know lots of different details. They're very, very particular, even with the size that the nutrition label has to be. So thank heavens there are software programs that basically give you the finished label, and that's the type of program that I use. But so you can see from the, from the list, we have total calories, calories from fat, total fat, saturated fat, trans fat, and on down the list. These are the ones on uh, most food products that you see in the store will be present. You might see a lot of other ones, especially on uh, cereal packages which are highly fortified. So the mandatory ones are listed in blue and the voluntary ones are listed in black on your screen. So you can see there's polyunsaturated, monounsaturated, potassium, soluble fiber, insoluble fiber, lots of different things that companies might choose to put on, if they choose, and they're not an exempt um, manufacturer from nutrition labeling, they must be listed in this order. But typically, all the people that I have worked with just go with the mandatory ones. So it's a complicated business, I will say that. I'm always learning something new. So here's a, a sample nutrition facts label. You can see the various things. I'm sure you all look at these regularly when you buy your foods in the store. I hope I, I hope you do. I'm a dietitian, so I'm very much into nutrition labeling. So what is the serving size? So let's say you have a food product and you are going to list a serving size on that food product. Even the serving sizes are regulated, so there's a full list on the FDA website. There's a lot more information than what we're providing, but those are also regulated, so you wouldn't say that a serving of milk was 16 ounces or two cups. The serving size by law is eight ounces or 240 milliliters. So this one with two servings per container would actually be a pint of milk. So then we also have on many nutrition facts labels what's called the daily reference values. And they are set for macronutrients that are sources of energy. Macro means big. Uh, so fat, saturated fat, total carbs, and protein will all be listed um, with a daily reference value or a percent DV is how they're listed on the label. Um, then there are the daily reference values for products or um, macronutrients that do not contain calories, and those include cholesterol, sodium, and potassium. Potassium is not required on a label. So I wanted to show you another example because when we look at nutrition labels and when consumers are looking at nutrition labels, sometimes we want them to eat less and sometimes we want them to eat enough and sometimes we want them to eat more. 
So the ones that we really want to um, you know, get less than in most cases, total fat, cholesterol, sodium. On the other hand, the purple ones on this screen, dietary fiber, vitamin A, C, calcium, and iron are ones that typically people are not eating enough of or not ingesting enough of. So there also are rules for what constitutes um, low. So low in fat, 5% or less is low. High, high in sodium, 20% or more of this of the uh, daily value. So let's give you a quick little quiz here. Look at the sodium value at 470 milligrams. Is that high or low? Is that high sodium or low sodium? Yeah. Thank you very much. That's exactly correct. So there's more than what meets the initial eye in, in nutrition labeling. So back in 2006, already 10 years ago, the Food and Drug Administration mandated that trans fat or trans fatty acids be listed on labels. And some of the foods that contain trans fats are those with hydrogenated oils in them. So um, those, this nutrient, not really a nutrient, <laughs> this food component must be listed as undersaturated fat. Trans fat is the type that's worse for you. So least heart healthy, I'll say. So there is a loophole for manufacturers. They do not have to list trans fat if the um, total fat is less than 0.5 grams per serving and no claims are made. So there's a little loophole that there might actually be some trans fat as long as they meet those guidelines. So there we go. That's where you'd find the trans fat and I you know, I encourage you to take a look at trans fat, but don't only look at trans fat itself because this one listed as zero might actually have some if you look farther down into the ingredient statement and you see hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated listed. That means that this fat has undergone a process, maybe it started out as an oil, and hydrogen addition, a chemical process, that causes a change in the conformation of the fat. And this type of fat is linked with um, lowering our good cholesterol, or HDL, and raising our bad cholesterol, or LDL. So really an important thing to look at, um, something quite new. In some foods, naturally, we have some trans fat that occurs, very small amounts. Even milk has a tiny amount. Meat has a tiny amount naturally occurring. But most of the trans fat would come in the form of bakery products that have the addition of partially hydrogenated shortenings. So take a close look. This is not only a, a food entrepreneurship talk, it's also a bit of a nutrition talk today. Important to know this for our own health. Okay, so ingredient statements. Let's take a closer look. They're required on all foods with more, more than one ingredient. And ingredients are listed with the most first, and the ingredient weighing the least is last. And if it's just a tiny amount, it can be um, sometimes like spices, for example, can simply be listed as spices. So if any of you are producing food products or selling food products, um, it is important to list the ingredients on the label. Say if you were even at a farmer's market um, selling a baked good, for example, I would list the ingredients and I would also list the allergens that might be present. Ingredients are covered by another uh, piece within the Code of Federal Regulations 101.4. So for example, if you had any artificial colors in your food product, it must be listed by the specific name, such as FDNC red number 40 or red 40. And chemical preservatives must be listed by common or usual name and the function of the preservative. So for example, if as Cliff mentioned earlier, you were making apple slices and you used ascorbic acid, which is basically an anti-darkening ingredient, you would say ascorbic acid and the function is to promote color retention. So if any chemical preservatives are there, you do need to list it by function so people know what they're consuming.
So here's an example. Here's where the ingredient statement would be. You'd have your nutrition facts if you needed it. Even if you don't need the nutrition facts on your product, you do have to list the ingredients. And in this case, tomatoes are found in the highest amount, you know, on down water and so on, soybean oil, and then natural flavoring. So probably the hardest part of my job when I'm helping a company work on an ingredient statement, I have to go back into the FDA rules sometimes to see which are, which are actually spices and which are food ingredients. So sometimes it takes a little bit of research to figure that out. If you are making a product with multiple ingredients, let's say you were making a barbecue sauce and you were using a commercial ketchup, and maybe you're adding some commercial barbecue sauce, or adding other ingredients, you would list all of those ketchup ingredients first, if that was your first unit, and then you'd list the additional items later. So sometimes these ingredient statements can be quite long and involved. So food, or food labels must also include the name and address of the manufacturer, and this information is required. So the business name, street address, city, state, and zip code. So if you're even, you know, we'll discuss this at the very end, but say you're in North Dakota selling a product at a market, you do need to list your business name and some way for that person to be able to find you in case they have a question or a problem. So you have to have that. You don't have to have a nutrition label necessarily, but you do need to let people know what they're buying common name and how much they're buying and so on. So uh, according to the FDA rules, and I don't know that they're fully up to date here because now everyone, everyone looks online to find uh, address and so on, but according to what they have currently, the actual street address can be omitted if the firm name is correctly listed in the current phone book. And a telephone number may be listed or email address may be listed but it's not required. I think that a lot of people now just list a website right on the food package. So that's certainly another option. So as I mentioned, there are many ways that food labels can be listed. They can be formatted in a very basic way, as you can see. So this doesn't have all of those nutrients listed. Sometimes if you're making a can, like you can see the one in the center looks almost like a tuna can. So kind of a long way, and then the typical one is shown on the right. So there are many ways, um, as I said, software allows us to be able to create these very simply, but depending on what size of your package, we can, uh, you know, we could help you do that. So next, um, as we are wrapping up here, nutrition claims can follow into one of several categories. There can be a health claim, there can be a nutrient content claim, a structure function claim, or even dietary guidance statements. So all of these fall under a specific part of the Code of Federal, Federal Regulations. So here's an example of a health claim. And if you make a health claim, you have to have the research to back it up. Large companies have gotten into a lot of trouble for making claims that they haven't been able to fulfill. So they've sometimes had to take the product off the market because it's been mislabeled because they haven't followed through with everything. So when you see a health claim on a product from a major company, you can actually trust that they have gone through all of the paperwork necessary for them to be able to list that. So I'm sure you've read this by now, but this would be a um, heart disease health claim. So diets low in saturated fat and cholesterol may reduce the risk of heart disease. Um, nutrient content claims, also regulated. So if you decide to put on your package, this is low cholesterol, there's less sugar, it's an excellent source of calcium, you have to have the data that backs up what your claim is. Excellent has a meaning, <laughs> um, so it has, a, has to have a certain percent to say excellent. If it says good source of calcium, that's another specific amount. If it says less sugar, it has to be a certain percent lower than the regular product. So again, very, very regulated. Whenever I'm talking to people about nutrition labels on foods, I always let them know that this is one of the areas they can actually trust what a package says. 
What you read in a magazine doesn't undergo the scrutiny. What you read on the on a website, you know, anyone can put anything on a website. But if you see it listed on a food package, and I'd say if it's a very reputable company that has put this out, they have gone through all of the necessary paperwork. So you can trust what they say. Um, an example of a structure function claim, or three examples, calcium builds strong bones. Fiber maintains regularity. Lycopene, which is a pigment in tomatoes, maintains cell integrity. These would be examples of those. Again, if you want to list a health claim or structure function claim, you have to have the data. You have to have the research to back you up. So be very cautious if you decide to do that. And then finally, in this particular list, um, our dietary guidelines recently came out for 2015 to 20. And of course, we always promote eating more fruits and vegetables. And there's plenty of research to say that diets rich in fruits and vegetables may reduce the risk of cancer and many other chronic diseases. So that would be a dietary guidelines type of claim. So if you have questions and you know want to know more about these, you know certainly get in contact with me or do some more reading about this because um, really important you you don't want to mislabel your food product because that can cause it to be recalled. So this I'm giving you the answer. <laughs> this is actually this whole lesson that we're doing is part of a module that we created earlier. If you go to the Field to Fork website and you scroll down a little bit, we have a whole website all about food entrepreneurship with many, many modules on them. So if you want to go through this again and you know try it out again, read a little more, I uh, certainly visit that website. Um, the field of fork, which also has some brand new handouts for those of you who maybe work in a farmer's market who just released 10 new handouts. Well, health claim you can see, three grams of soluble fiber from oatmeal, blah, 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 may reduce the risk of heart disease. Um, a nutrient content claim, reduced fat. Structure function claim, antioxidants and cell integrity. And dietary guidance, again, diets rich in fruits and vegetables may reduce the risk of certain diseases. Then we might have some warnings. Um, the warnings may include avoid spraying in your eyes. Or there might be safe handling instructions on the meat products that you see. These, again, fall under a different category of food labeling. So one of the newest areas, the newest features on labels besides trans fat is the requirement to list food allergens. And food allergies are very, very important because they can be fatal. Um, someone who goes into anaphylactic shock, who doesn't know that there's a certain ingredient in this food, um, could die. So it's, it's very, very important that you let the public know that there's nuts present or any of the eight major allergens. So the food allergies affect 2% of adults and 5% of infants and young children. And some more statistics, 30,000 individuals require emergency room treatment, and 150 individuals die because of allergic reactions to food. So this is all in the US. So it's very, very important to be aware of. So again, the eight, um, there are eight major food allergens, milk, eggs, fish, crustaceans, shellfish, tree nuts, peanuts, which are actually called ground nuts, wheat, and soybeans are the eight main ones to think about. So is it required? Yes, of course it's required. And it's printed immediately after or adjacent to the list of ingredients. And it's very simple. You simply say, contains peanuts, contains wheat, milk, and soy. So it's sometimes kind of amusing when you pick up a jug of milk, and then underneath it says, contains milk. Well, of course it contains milk. But that is required. So you might see, you know, for example, another one on a can of peanuts. Probably will say, contains peanuts. So that is just exactly how they have to list the information. And sometimes you might also see processed in a facility that processed, you know, then they'll list the different allergens because there can be cross-contamination that could occur. So the last thing I wanted to share with you, we're about done here, um, and I'll see who's still alive and listening <laughs> on the call. Um, Chris mentioned that 
we have some certain requirements, labeling requirements from the Division of Food and Lodging in North Dakota, and I would venture to say that these would be similar to what some of you who are visiting us from other states would also have to follow. So in the chat box, get your little fingers ready to type, what are what information must appear on the principal display panel? What do you have to let customers know, regardless of what you're selling? And I would say this would be the case if you're selling something at a farmer's market or processing a food. Name a product, net weight, who made it? Very good. Anything else? Say yes, correct, Annie. What did I just talk about? Ingredients, exactly. Place of business, very good. And um, a couple more things I haven't mentioned. Um, our North Dakota rules say that we must attach some kind of identification number on the label that tells the date and the site of manufacture. And also, and I'm going to I'm going to post this. Or it's actually up already on our website, and this uh, session will also be archived. But there is a direct link to what I'm talking from. You must maintain production records and keep them on the premises for a year. So you've got to identify when you made it, and including the date and site, and then keep those records on premises. So for those of you from other states, I would definitely suggest that you check your state food and lodging or whatever it's called in your state and find out the exact rules for what you need to follow. And then the other piece, um, if the food requires refrigeration, the label must state this. So for example, if you're selling Coogan, which is a custard-based product, then it re if it requires refrigeration, you either have to have a refrigerator on premises if the um, particular farmer's market, for example, allows you to sell foods such as that, you'd have to also list on the food product requires refrigeration. Okay. And finally, if your food product, say our Colorado friends again, say you're going to try to sell your product in North Dakota. So before you only had to cover what your food food rules were in Colorado. Now if you're crossing over into North Dakota, or we in North Dakota are selling to Colorado or South Dakota, it's now crossing state lines. So it's now under the jurisdiction of the Food and Drug Administration or USDA depending on the product. So sometimes we can be within our, our state, but sometimes if we cross over, we have to follow some additional rules. And oh, I just saw something, Vanessa, I like your idea. I would also agree with um, Vanessa's comment that you should list your allergens. It isn't required according to what the rules say on our North Dakota site, you know, for what's required, but I would definitely add it. Um, I'm sure in their next rendition of their rules, they will be adding it because, you know, of the potential fatality that could occur with um, allergens that aren't listed. So we've got a little bit over our time. We had quite an ambitious schedule today. But I certainly thank you for being here today. And again, these are all archived. And I just made a quick trip over to my Word document because I'm going to pop up the Qualtrics link. This is also going to be emailed to you. I certainly welcome you to go and check out any arch archived webinars that you've missed of the 10 that we're now done with, and check out the other materials on the site. I think there are some things that whether you're a home gardener or you're a commercial farmer's market grower, I think you'll find some things that are helpful for you. So if you have questions for me, I'm going to have you just go ahead and get in contact with me following the webinar. I'm easy to find. and. Uh, Thank you very much for your participation. Please take the survey.